but at least we somehow managed to go through the solution. So what I was planning today was, uh, you know, there's one lecture left. I'll try to list some of the other solved models so that you become familiar with at least the names and what they are. So if you find something familiar in your research, you can look at them. So the uh, next one, the One other class of models that is exactly solvable is the Dimer model. So let me define the model. So uh, A dimer is a uh, molecule that covers two neighboring sites. So, uh, so this is a dimer. And uh, the rule is that two dimers cannot overlap. So I cannot put a dimer here, but I can put a dimer here. So I cannot put one, this is not allowed. So the the most general question would be, if I have dimers and vacancies, how do I solve that problem? So that problem is not solvable, but the problem of fully packed dimers is solvable. So, fully packed. So this says that I, I should put dimers such that they don't overlap, but every single side is covered. So for example, this is a dimer covering. Well, I chose uh, 5 cross 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 25, the wrong number. 25 cannot be covered with dimers because every dimer covers 2. So we need even number, 6 cross, 4 cross 4, but this is an example of a dimer covering. Every single side is covered. So this problem on a honeycomb lattice, you have three orientations, 1, 2, and the third one, one, two, and three. Let me tell you what is known for this. So is the definition clear? Dimer model definition. So it turns out that if I have a two-dimensional simple lattice, I can always solve for the entropy of the dimer problem at full packing, even if they have weights too. So for example, in this problem, if I have weight, weight Z1, Z2, and Z3, I put three different fugacities for the three different directions, so that I break the symmetry between the three directions. Even then it is solvable. So I'll give you the prescription to solve a general dimer model. And, um, okay, I have to say one more thing. Let me just so it turns out for that the square lattice has no phase transition. At, in, at, at full packing, it remains disordered. Neither the horizontal nor the vertical is preferred. But the, so for the honeycomb lattice, there is a transition. So if I satisfy the condition that Z1 is greater than Z2 plus Z3, then, so that corresponds to, let me draw a triangle. This is the triangle inequality. So in this, in, within this, it is, uh, and cyclically, outside, it, satis it, satis it doesn't satisfy this condition, it becomes frozen. So you have a frozen state, a frozen state, and a disordered state. So it says if I take a dimer model on a honeycomb lattice, and vary the weights, I can have phase transition between a phase in which everything is pointing in one direction to one in which is pointing in all possible directions. Okay. 
So this is solvable and there's a difference from the icing model. So if you plot Cv as a function of temperature, so there is a particular Pc that corresponds to going from a frozen to disordered phase. The Cv is uh, zero and then one by root of T minus C. So it's a bit different from the icing model. From one direction it diverges and from the other direction it is zero. In the icing model we had divergence from both sides as one as log T minus T C. So the diamond models can show No, but here there are two, so uh, let me make this statement. So there are many kinds of diamond models. One of them is on a lattice like this, but you can make more complicated models. You can make on a, on, uh, a decorated lattice and so on. So depending on the kind of diamond model you have, you have two kinds of transition. One like this and the other like the icing transition. So there are both kinds, depending on the model you choose, it's possible to have either. But if I take the honeycomb lattice, you find a different behavior which is solvable. So I, I, I'll give a prescription how to solve a generic uh, diamond model and I'll leave it at that. Okay, so it says, if I have a diamond model on some lattice like this, then my partition function, the free energy is one by says for every diamond model there is some matrix M whose dimension is small and if you take the de determinant of that matrix and take the logarithm you can find the, eigen find the partition function. So the question is how to write the matrix M. Ah, so for this one, so it, this one says if I take a honeycomb lattice I can have diamonds of three kinds. They can be vertical or pointing in this way or this way. If something is pointing this way, I have a weight Z2. The fugacity is Z2. So that corresponds to some energy. E to the power minus, e to the power log Z2 is my energy. So therefore, there's a, then the, once you have energies for different bonds, you can control it by temperature. So this is against temperature. Okay. So the honeycomb lattice, if, if the Zs are equal, you have a disordered phase. Otherwise, you have something called a frozen phase in which all of them pointing in the Z1 direction or Z2 direction or Z3 direction, depending on which one is larger. So it's like everything is, there is no fluctuation anymore. It is just stuck in one place. Okay. So there's a prescription for how to write M. So for example, for this model, M, M is 2 cross 2. But if I have more complicated matrices, I have more complicated way of writing it. So I, I uh, you know, the uh, how to write M depends on a few extra things which I don't want to explain. You know, there are some arrows to be drawn and so on. But what I like to say is you should look at a very nice introduction to this by the uh, Nagli and Patajal. Dompen, are you familiar with this book, Dompen Green? Have you seen these books? So there are these books uh, on phase transition critical phenomena, volume one, volume two, volume three, like that. And this is volume 13. So in this, uh, in this article, they tell you how to do M for different kinds of lattices. So all of them are solvable. You know, of, of solvable diamond models, how to solve. So you should take a look at them. So there are, as I said, there are two, three features. One is that they show, if they show a transition, there are two kinds of singular behavior, either one by root of T minus Tc or the icing answer. So 
now why does the icing answer come? It turns out that if you take a lattice of this kind, so let me draw one, two, I take a square lattice. On a, so I take a square lattice. So if you look at one vertex, it is consist, it's made up of four bonds coming at a corner. You replace this particular node by a line like this and a triangle. So I should, uh, so let me make it clear. So I have a square lattice. I look at a particular node here. So that is four of them. I remove this particular node. So that makes it like this. And this point, I draw a triangle like this, a triangle like that, and join them. So every node is expanded into two triangles like this. Six bonds come, six sides. One, two, three, four, five, six. So what was a node here became six nodes here. So I do this to every node. Look at this one, I have one, two, three. But yeah. So that's okay. So I'm making a decorated, I'm taking a square lattice and making a decorated lattice in which each node, each vertex, I replace with a complicated complicated diagram there. No, I'm I'm defining my lattice to be that. This is my new lattice. So from the construction is this one, so I'll call this a decorated lattice. So it turns out that if you solve the diamond model on this lattice, through a prescription like this, you get the icing model answer. So this, so, uh, so this solution of diamond on this lattice, is icing model on square lattice. On square lattice, not on this lattice, but on the square lattice. So in fact, many properties of the icing model is derived using this condition. Because the diamond model, you can have, you have a prescription for solving, which of course requires a bit of work to do, but once you have a prescription, it's very easy to solve. So that is what I want to tell about the Dimer model. Is there anything else? Yeah. As I said, I want to make a list of other solvable models. Just a brief summary. Uh, so the first question is, suppose I take the full packed limit and introduce vacancies. Then what happens? The answer is nothing can be, nothing can be said except that the moment you put vacancies, you can, be, you, you can sh show that there can never be an ordered phase but you cannot find an exact solution for that. But that problem is interesting. So, so uh, why are they interesting? This is the simplest, uh, or one of the simplest models for, of example of what's called a hardcore model. Hardcore exclusion model. So these are models where of particles whose only interaction is that they cannot overlap. But when they're not overlapping, there is no uh, energy. So what it means is that if I take a particular configuration, all configurations have equal energy. Now these happen to be minimal models. Minimal models for entropy driven phase transition. Are you familiar with what are entropy driven phase transitions? No. So let us look at the icing model as an example. 
So icing model, you have temperature, zero temperature, infinite temperature, and some PC. This is my ordered phase, the ferromagnetic phase, and the disordered phase. As I go from here to here, as I decrease temperature, what, what, what drives, what decreases my free energy? My free energy is lowered, lowered. In this particular phase, if I compare the free energy of the ordered phase with the free energy of the disordered phase, the free energy of the ordered phase is lower. But it's lower because of what? Energy. Because you know the things start aligning. So I'll call this transition an energy driven transition. Energy driven. Okay. Now let me give another example. The other example is I take a 3D box, I put balls inside. And they're hard balls, and I increase density. This may look surprising, but if I increase density high enough, they start forming a solid. Okay, so this is a liquid. And this is a solid. This can be even seen experimentally that if you take hard balls and increase density, you form a solid. So the liquid to solid transition, which is a freezing transition, does not require any attractive interactions. They can be driven purely by repulsive interactions. And uh, so if they're repulsive, then I'm going from a disordered phase to an ordered phase. My energy is not lowered, but my free energy is higher. So what drives the free energy here? My F is roughly like E minus Cs. So this doesn't change. This has to be lowered only by entropy. So this has higher entropy. The solid has higher entropy. And this transition is uh, entropy driven. So it turns out that there are quite a few transitions that are entropy driven. And uh, one way to study them is to look at simple models. And the simple models are these hardcore exclusion models. Ah, so uh, this is a 3D. This is a 3D, uh, this is a schematic diagram. You have to put in a, a 3D, you know, uh, HCP packing or something like that. In 2D, uh, you cannot have this transition, but in 3D, 2D is a bit complicated. Because, you know, in Mustafa, one of the talks told about uh, that the upper critical limit is 2 for some systems. If you have a continuous symmetry, which is the transitional symmetry is continuous here, so you cannot break it in two dimensions. You can only break it in three dimensions. There's a theorem that says that continuous symmetries cannot be broken in 2D can only be broken in 3D. So here the symmetry that is broken is the transition symmetry, which is continuous, and then it becomes discrete that. That cannot be done in two dimensions. It can only be done in three dimensions. Okay. Mm. So what is the point? Ah, so these hardcore exclusion models are minimal models for studying these, and people have studied various shapes. So these transitions and phases are different in the shape. But you can ask, now what are the exactly solvable models in this field? And hard core particles. Uh, so let, let me write some statement here. So one is that phases depend on on shape. So these are extensively studied. You no know, people study cubes. Uh, um, I don't know banana shape molecules, tet tetris molecules, you know, things like that. But in, in spite of that, you can ask, uh, so I want to ask, what are the exactly solved models of hard particles? Models. Okay. So as far as I know, there are two of them. So I'll just briefly tell what they are. One is uh, long cylinders, long cylinders in 3D continuum. 
This you should know. It's a very classic equation. And B is uh, hard hexagons on triangular lattice. So I'll describe what are these and what is known roughly. So, uh, so one. <coughs> So this problem A was studied by Onsager long ago. So what he took was he took a lot of cylinders which have a long aspect ratio. So if I take a cylinder like this, so they have shell two. If this length is L and the dimension is D, let me define K equals L by D. That's my aspect ratio. Now, for very low densities, these things don't see each other. And they, uh, they're far from each other. They orient in any direction they want. Some of them orient like this, some of them orient like that, and so on. At what point will they start seeing each other? So my control parameter, I have no control parameter, only one control parameter, density. At what densities will they start interacting? If I just take needles like this, imagine them to be balls. I have very low density, they're very far away. I increase the density. Roughly, when will they start seeing each other? Yeah, so when this length, so when the interparticle spacing, interparticle spacing is uh, roughly size of particle. Otherwise, they won't see each other. So if I have a certain density, number density rho, what's my interparticle spacing? One by, so interparticle spacing goes as one by, if my, if num, I will call num n, number density to be one by three. Correct? This, is, this gives me length, length. one by length, Length cube, cube root is one by, okay. And they should go as this length L, L. Okay. So if I look at the volume fraction, so roughly when my, now, let me call the NC, the number density at which the rods start interacting. So NC goes as one by L cube. So what's my volume fraction? Phi C, goes as number density times uh, the volume of a cylinder, which is d square L, which is d square by L square, which is one by K square. So when my volume fraction roughly starts going as one by K square, where K is my aspect ratio, they start interacting. So Onsega asked the question, what happens when they start interacting? Is that clear? So, uh, so, I need to type the expression for free energy. Are you people familiar with the Virial expansion? So, suppose I, I you know, when you did StatMec, I have a, I, you first study, study the uh, ideal gas in which there's no interaction. Then you switch on a small interaction. There's a small interaction as in they have a finite size. How do you do that problem? How do you derive the Van der Waals equation of state? You can, you can take care of the interaction perturbatively, which is called the, uh, can I write here? The virial expansion. So, we're, uh, so suppose I have a, a density is low enough and uh, so your density is small. So things are far away, they don't interact, but there's a small interaction. So there is expansion called the virial expansion. you 
the free energy goes as some log rho constant plus log rho plus d2 rho square plus d3 rho cube plus so on, where rho is the density of my, it's a spherical particles. So this is something you find in, you should have done, the virial expansion. So what Onsegar did was he took the virial expansion. Of course, now you have particles oriented in many directions, phi. So you can treat a particular direction as another species. So for every phi, you think of multi-species particle, you can generalize this expansion. And what he showed was that B3 by B2 goes to zero when K goes to infinity. So if you set up, an, if you set up a virial expansion like this for the rod problem, and then you ask how do the particular virial coefficients behave, then in the limit of infinite cylinders, you can drop all the terms up to here, and this expansion becomes exact, truncation becomes exact. So in the limit of k going to infinity, you have an exact answer. And what you showed was that dots are pointed like this, and as you increase density, they become pointed in one direction. What is this phase called? Nematic. Okay. So this happens when phi is order one by k square. So the nematic phase is one where the initial rotational symmetry is broken. All of them point in one direction. But if I look at the center of these particles, they have no transitional order. So only the orientational symmetry is break, broken, not the transitional symmetry. Okay, that's a nematic phase. This happens for the infinitely long rods. But if you do finite rods also, this happens. Liquid crystals are one example where there are more interactions, but well modeled by uh, these hard rods. Is that, uh, so this Onsegger's paper came uh, after the icing model solution, and both are, have been uh, one of the first exact, exactly solved model, as well as you know, this made a uh, conceptual uh, thing about you know getting the cinematic phase and so on. Okay, so now, so the first one question you can ask is, can I solve it for finitely uh, uh, size rods? It's not possible. But when nothing is possible, what is the first lecture we learn? We should solve it on a mean, mean field. What mean field is what? How do you solve mean field weather lattice? Okay. So now let me tell you that that is always not the, the best way. Uh, so in five minutes, let me tell you why the weather lattice is not the greatest lattice for solving. Uh, so let me draw a better lattice. I need three, three colors. I'm going to draw a better lattice of, I'm, so I'm going to ask if I have finite length rods, is a better lattice a good model for solving them? So I want to see the isotropic nematic transition for finite length rods a bit more rigorously. So I look at better lattice of coordination number six. Is the diagram clear? This is one, two, three, four, five, six bonds come six bonds coming out of this side. It connects to the next one, one like this, one like that, and one like that, and so on. And this way also. Okay. This is a six coordinated beta lattice. Now, let's assume there is a nematic order. So I'll call this one, two, I have to define more clearly what I mean by putting the dots here. One, two, three. Okay, there are three colored bonds. If I look at a, a, a rod of size K, they should all follow, follow the yellow line or the green line or the red line. So those are, that is the rule. Now you assume that there is nematic order in direction one or direction three, okay. 
let's assume that direction three has pneumatic order. Then what does that mean? It means row three is greater than row one equals row two. That's my definition of pneumatic order. It breaks the uh, orientational symmetry you had. Now I come to the next side. So at this side, the yellow is more. I come to this side. So from this side, I can put, there is yellow here and there is blue here. No, green here. But what I call yellow and what I call green is up to me. I could have called this as yellow or this as green. I had a completely free choice, which means this is my two. Row two is equal to row three. I could, have, I could have drawn this as yellow and this as green too. It would have changed nothing. So if I assume that there is pneumatic order along three, I run into the contradiction immediately at the next step. No, that's why the hardcore interaction cannot distinguish them. I, I, the hardcore, distinguish, hardcore interaction doesn't care what is called, called yellow. If I had an icing model, it will distinguish but not the hardcore interaction. So it just says that I cannot have, which implies no nematic order. No nematic order. So the better lattice is not a good lattice for solving the k map. So it, it looks like it's no nice to solve and so on, but it's often not the case. So for, if you want to do some mean field, you should do on some other lattice. Is the, Oh, hard, all hard interactions. These are all, hard, we are discussing hardcore models. It just says if I put a particle on a lattice site, another particle cannot sit there. Uh, so now I look at B, the other hard problem that is solvable, hard hexagon. This was solved by uh, Baxter. So now let me define this particular model. So I take a, uh, this is square lattice. How do I make it a triangular lattice? I draw these diagonal bonds. This is a triangular lattice. Yeah, that we'll discuss later. But this is not, this turns out to be not a good lattice. You have to think of some other way of doing mean field than this one. This is a problem with uh, even other models with hard interactions. This, the, exactly the same problem comes. So this is a triangular lattice. So the hard hexagon, hexagon model says a particle lives on a lattice site. If it stays here, then it excludes the neighbors from being occupied. I cannot occupy this one. I cannot occupy this one. Six neighbors are disallowed from being occupied. So in there is one, one other way of writing. This is the one NN model. the first nearest neighbor exclusion model on the one nearest neighbor. You can of course generalize it two and three and four. So those are not solvable. So why is this the hard, he hard hexagon model? Because I can color this like this. If I think of this as a hexagon, then I, I, my problem corresponds to putting these shapes, they can touch but they cannot overlap. So I can put a hexagon, another hexagon uh, here. This is allowed. So this is the hard uh, hexagon model. 
Okay. So the first thing to look at, it, so what's my control parameter again? Density. So I want to ask at high density, what is my ordered state? There's no ordering in this, trans in this problem. What is my ordered phase? So for that, you look at the full packing. So fully packed limit. Is the definition of the model clear? One and n on the triangular lattice. So I take my triangular lattice. Now I'm going to put a label for each side as follows. I take a particular site, I call this one. This is two, this is three, this is three, and so on. Okay. Suppose I put a, a uh, particle here that corresponds to putting a hexagon on this like that. You see? do it well. This is a hard hexagon I put there. The next one, where can I put? This is two, three, two, one. This is two, this is three, this is two, this is one. One, two, and so on. I label my sites into three kinds, one, two, and three, labeled like this. If I put a particle on this one, the other particle I can put here on this one. I can put one here and so on. So you can check that is full packing. I can put a particle on each one or each two or each three. So my maximal density is L by N by, number of particles is L squared by three. All one, all two, or all three. Okay. So what happens is if I look at a vector corresponding to N1, N2, and N3, this is number of particles on lattice of type one, sites of type two, and sites of type three. At full packing, you're either here either here or here. In the disordered phase, at low density, where are you? In the disordered phase, N1 must be equal to N2 equal to N3. So it's somewhere here. So as I vary density, I could go from a phase in which your, your point lies one of these points to a point that comes here. Okay. So one way to quantify this is to look at the vector Q is N1 plus N2 you make a complex number out of these big quantities and you look at mod Q as a function of density when you are in the fully ordered phase Q is 1 because either N1 equal to one, or N2 equal to one, or N3 equal to one. In the disordered phase, you're somewhere here, zero. So there could be, it's possible that there's a transition like that. This looks very much like your icing model transition. Q is your order parameter. When Q is non-zero, it means I break the symmetry between one, two, and three. So the hard hexagon, the hard, uh, hexagon model has this transition. So this is solvable, so I'll little tell you what the answer is. So this Baxter solved, and what he found, so 
I'll now summarize what is the answer. You have a critical fugacity, which is, when I say fugacity, what it means is I, I take a problem for each configuration, I assign a weight z to the power number of hexagons in that. Like here, like here, yes. This is a triangular lattice. This is a triangular lattice. Particles live on the triangular lattice. In the fully packed limit, it picks out a certain fraction of them. And, in, so, uh, and it turns out that I can, if I do a correct labeling, they pick out either one, two, or three. All of them are in one, or all of them are in two, or all of them are in three. There are three possibilities. In the disordered phase, there are equal number in one, equal number in two, and equal number in three. That is the point, no? This entropy driven transition, liquid to solid transition can be modeled by uh, uh, repulsive forces. Yes. Yes, so like you're freezing liquid to solid, the minimal model is a repulsive, uh, there's only repulsive interaction. Yes. Uh, in this case, yeah. No, this is a discrete symmetry. The symmetry here is what? We, in the, uh, huh? What is the symmetry of uh, uh, symmetry group that is broken? Huh? S3. I could have made any permutation of one, two, three. Z3 would be if I had just rotation like that, cyclic rotation. This is one to two, two to three, any, any permutation I can make and I still get the same answer. So this is S3. So that's a symmetry that is broken. It is not a continuous symmetry that is broken. Yeah, so in the sol let me write down the solution. Then the answers. Answer is Zc is the number, is some number, but I should write it down. 1 by 2 into 11 plus 5 root 5. Okay. Now there's a history to this number. So you know, we had discussed this high temperature expansion, low temperature expansion. So you can, you can derive many terms and try to guess your ZC from there. So somebody, somebody, not really somebody, but okay. Someone actually generated by hand many terms in this expansion. And from there actually guessed five root five, 11 plus five root five to be the ZC of this before it was actually shown. I, that is quite remarkable, you know, to get five root five from a, a numerical series and to guess from there was quite, uh, anyway. Um, that was uh, conducted by Gorn. He used to do a lot of series expansion. Uh, then you can find all the critical exponents. Alpha is 1 by 3. Beta is 1 by 9. Gamma is 13 by 9. And delta equals 14. Okay, nu equals 5 by 6. These are the exponents that correspond to three state parts model two. Three state. Because the symmetry broken is exactly the same, S3. So these could be derived exactly by the solution of the hard. It's a very difficult solution, uh, but uh, whatever. You can check that if I, you should compare this with the icing answer. Icing is icing. Let me write down the icing answer also. Icing is 1, 1 by 8, gamma is uh, 7 by 4, delta is 15, and nu is 1. They all changed, but if I take alpha plus 2 beta plus gamma, 1 by 3 plus 2 by 9 plus 13 by 9. That is 3, 5, 18 by 9, which is 2. Which is true for the icing model also. So the exponents change, but you can check 
uh, if I take 2 beta by nu plus gamma by nu, you should get 2 for both the models and so on. You take uh, uh, alpha 2 minus alpha equal to d nu, 2 nu. This again you can check that for the both the models is the same. So the scaling hypothesis tells you some exponent equalities and they will match with this exact solution. So that you should check. So this is the hard. So we were discussing that if you take hard core models, there are two solved models. One of them is the Onsega solution for infinitely long rods, and there's a hard uh, hexagon model in two dimension, the solvable. There are some variants of this you can solve, a bit more complicated version, but they're all related to this one. Okay. Uh, shall I go ahead? Next one. So the next one is uh, the vertex models. Uh, so we move from our models to, so you should, just, you, you should just remember these names in case, you know, somewhere you read you should know that there is some solved model which you can look up or you can map your model to the vertex model. So, um, so here the idea is you have a square lattice and you, go, you assign arrows to each bond. Arrow can be up, so if I take a square lattice, I take a particular site, I can assign up arrow or down arrow and so on. How many ways can I assign arrows to a single vertex? So if I look at a, per a particular vertex, I have four bonds coming out of that. How many ways can I assign arrow configuration? No, for this vertex, 2 to the power 4, that is uh, 16, okay, but that is not solvable. So what you want to do is make a restriction. So the first restriction is something called the 6 vertex model. Okay, where you say that I allow all possible arrow configurations provided at each node Two come in and two go out. Okay. How many? So, at, so for example, this is going out, this is coming in, this is going out, this is coming in. This is allowed. Here, one goes out, one goes out, one goes out, one comes in. Not allowed. Okay. So I, I eliminate many configurations. You can ask how many are allowed. So the allowed ones are one, two. Let me draw it in the order which I got this one. Two come in and two go out, and this is the opposite of that. One. Six of them, okay. six possible things, and usually you assign a certain energy to this one, six. same energy to this one, same energy to these two, and same energy to these three. So let me call this as e to the power a is The idea is you take uh, a particular bond configuration, you put arrows on them with the constraint that at each side two come in and two go out. Then for each bond configuration at the side, you assign an energy 
e1 to e6, but we'll make it e1 to e1, e2 equal, e3, e4 equal, and e5, e6 equal. And then you ask, as I change my temperature, what possible phases can exist? This was motivated first by people studying ice. So these are also sometimes called ice models. In fact, uh, by solving such a model, they got an estimate for entropy, some entropy number, which actually matches the entropy of I squared well. But uh, now let me tell how this, briefly tell how this is solved and uh, what is known. Is the definition of the six vertex model clear? Six vertex model. So the first thing to do is to ask, uh, well, I should have uh, drawn on top of this. First thing to do is I'm going to change these into lines. I'm going to do a mapping where for every vertex configuration like this, I'm going to replace them with some line configuration as follows. Okay. So it says, uh, I take a bond. If it is in the downward direction, I put a line. If it's in the leftward direction, I put a line. So down or left, put a line. So for example, if I take this one, this is up, up, right, right. I have no lines, so I'll call it as dotted lines. If I look at this one, this is down, down, left, left. So I will draw it as follows. I'll put a line here and a line like this. There are four lines coming, but let us draw them like this without touching. I look at this one, this is down, down, right, right. So this corresponds to a dotted line, the line going down. What I'm doing is for every spin config, every vertex configuration, I'm making an equivalent line configuration. If I look at this one, these are both going up. So I get dotted line there and a thick line in this direction. This one corresponds to a line like this, dotted line on the other side, and a dotted line like this. Is it clear? Wherever a downward line comes, I'm putting a thick line. And if I look at this one, this is, this is there's a left one here. So for each of these configurations, you get a thick lines like that. So if I can draw either these or these, and I can go from one to the other. Now, I want to draw a particular uh, a particular I want to take a, take a particular configuration and map it onto a line configuration. So I'm going to take a particular arrow configuration and going to map it onto a certain line configuration. So example is this is up, down, up, up, leftwards, rightwards. This one goes down, down, down. Okay. 
we have to just check that uh, it satisfies the constraint at every site. Two come in, two go out. Here, one to come in, one to go out, and so on. Now, what is the corresponding line configuration for this? This is upward, there's no line, but this is leftward. So I have to put a line here. So I have to put a line using a different color. I have to put a line here. This is rightward, no line. Downward, I have to put a line. Let's go to the, okay, let's look at this one. There's a line there. There's a line here. Here there's a line. Here there is no line. What about the next one? There's no line, there's a line and line, two lines. One, two, and the top one, no line, and two lines. Okay, next row. This is no line, there's a line here, there's a line there, and then there's no line. Here there are no lines. This is my corresponding, given an arrow configuration, this is a corresponding line configuration. Okay. There's an intersection here, so I'll be a bit careful. So I'll make it go like this, and make this one come down like this. I think this one should go right. If there was an arrow there, there's an arrow. Is it okay? So from a particular, particular arrow configuration, for every arrow configuration, you get a line configuration. Now, the idea, the key point is that if you look at these lines, and you look at this as time direction, then you can think of these as trajectories of particles. So these are trajectories of particles, provided provided the number of lines in the first column First row is the same as number of lines, second row, third row, and so on. So the line conservation one has to argue for. So the six vertex condition, six vertex condition implies line conservation. So that you have to look up somewhere, implies line conservation. So now the key step is to think of these as lines which they come nearby the ripple. If they're far away, they'll almost resemble non-interacting walk. Only when they come nearby, there's some interaction. So the, then the question is how to solve this model. So how you do is you ask, what is the answer? You divide into many sectors. Now the line is conserved. You ask what's the problem with no line, problem with one line, two lines, and so on. So you have many sectors. So you can, n equal to zero sector is easy to solve. There are no lines. Then you have n equal to one sector. So you have to write down the answer and see. So there's, there's a, there's a non-interacting walk. Then you have a two lines. So when you solve that, you'll realize that when things come nearby, there are some conditions to be satisfied. You write down the solution for this problem. You find, and then we try to extend it, see whether what you find for two, can you do for three, and so on. So there is some ansatz that you have to do to solve this, and that ansatz is called the Bethe ansatz, which has been used to solve many models. So this is a good place to learn how to do. This is a, one simple version, simple model where you can figure out how to apply the Bethe ansatz systematically by looking at small n equal to zero, one, two, and so on. There is another place. Uh, I will not tell how to do this. That becomes complicated, but you can solve it this way. If you want to learn Bethe ansatz even in a very simple way, I think the best place to read it is in an example, is to look at uh, uh, Halton Healy paper by Halton Healy. 
bank. These physics reports, I forget exactly when, 1990, the 1990s, and this is on, on the Kardak, on the KPZ equation. In that, he discusses the solution of the ASEP, the asymmetric exclusion process, which Martin will discuss next time. And he, uh, step by step, he shows how to apply the Bethian charge to that. And it's very easy to follow. So this, uh, uh, so it, it, uh, this, this one's a bit more complicated. So if you want to learn Bethian charge, this is the best place to learn. So it looks at walks, one walk, two walks, what happens when they interact, and how to include terms to take care of the interaction. In fact, I, I want to, you should please look up this review article and just look at how the better answers are implemented. I know the, the KPZ equation corresponds to a set of walkers uh, moving. Uh, you, you will learn it next week. The corresponding set of walkers move. The interface can be sometimes mapped onto a simple interface model. It can be mapped onto a set of particles moving on a one-dimensional lattice for being some hardcore constraint. And then the number, is, the number of particles conserved there. And then you can ask if, I, if they look, the, the, the trajectories of those lines, particles look like this. When they come nearby, they sort of repel each other. They, don't, they can't sit on the same side. And then the better answers can be applied to solve that problem. It looks very much, the trajectories look very much like this. But it's a simpler problem because you know it moves in uh, continuous time and so on. Okay. Uh, Ah, now what is the phase diagram of this model? I'm sorry, I'm giving a lot of information, uh, but you can just uh, listen. What is the phase diagram of this model? It is. Uh, A is the weight of the first two, B is the weight of these two, and C is the weight of the last two. So if I look at the ratio of A by C and B by C here, there is some line like this. And let me draw first. This is one, two, three, and four. The phase diagram of the six vertex model looks like this. One corresponds to when A is very large. When A is very large, these vertices dominate. And when these vertices dominate, how do they look like? So if I draw, if I look at one, if I take a particular, I look at very large A. If I put one vertex like this, vertex one. Then I'm constrained to put this one to up. Am I constrained? I have equal weight for these two. Am I constrained? I don't know. This arrow is this arrow comes like this, so this arrow I have to put outside. But what about these two? There's no constraint for that particularly. But I'm constrained to put this one up. So I have to put these two down here. What happens here? This I have to put here. But is there a constraint on the other one? No. Suppose I want to fill up the lattice with, my A is so large, I have to fill up with either one or two. So I, I put a one somewhere. So one corresponds to putting, I choose one here. Once I come to two, I have to make this one up. But do I have to, I, didn't, I have no constraint on this one particularly. Because I could have put like this or like that. So I have no constraint coming there.
Yes, so here it is constrained. So I have to put everything up, up, up like that. This whole column is up and this whole row is, has to be like this. Now how do I fill the next row? I could have chosen any direction I wanted, I think. If I, if I just fill up these two, and I am asking how can I fill the lattice with just these two vertices. B and C are zero. No, so, so that, that I decided. So these all become like that. Then, great, so full thing is up. So you have either a configuration where all of them are vertex one or vertex two. So we have a, this, this phase is called a ferroelectric phase. An ordered phase where all of them are of type one or type two. If I look at phase two, it just says that B is very large. I can I have to fill up the lattice with either this one or this one. It's exactly the same. So this is the ferroelectric phase. Ferroelectric phase, but of type of vertex three or four. This one, three happens to be a disordered phase. I'll just tell what that is, disordered phase. And four is when is dominated by C, these two. But how to draw a diagram with these two? So let me draw a square lattice once more. I put one where these two come in and these two go out. That is my vertex five. But this immediately constrains this one to be going out and these two to be coming in. And the next one to be both coming in and both going out. So it is, if this is plus, this is minus, this is plus. So this is called the, the four is called anti, anti-ferroelectric. Now three has no preference for any of the six vertices, the disordered phase, but there are some solvable limits. It turns out that you know, there's one line here, I don't know, some line like that. If you solve along that line, it turns out it's disordered, but the correlations don't die exponentially. The correlations die as a power law. Disordered, but this is strange, but that is what it is. Correlations decrease non exponentially, I think, power law. No, inside the region. Okay, so, ah, okay. so you have to read up the history of the Isaac model. The Isaac models came from a model for ferroelectric. So there is various limits of this, you know, when epsilon one equals, it. so the initial one where there is no, all the energies are the same, corresponds to I's. Then there is one where two of them are the same and two of them are different. That happens to be a model for ferroelectric and so on. So, you know, Historically, the name came like this. In fact, the mapping comes from hydrogen, some placing hydrogen, the dipoles there, and I don't know the reason. But it is, uh, there's a reason for that. Okay, so um, is it okay? So we are going fast. So one more model, we have two more models we have to discuss and that summarize what is known. So this is the six vertex model. Next is the eight vertex model. But that, uh, 
maybe I can just tell what the invertex model is because I want to tell about the uh, Gauge vertex model so you had it 16 vertices you put the constraint that two must come in and two must go out now we make the constraint that even number must come in and even number must go out so how many more should I add so even number must come in which means even number must go out how many more can I add? I have these vertices with six of them. So you have two more. All four come in and all four go out. So you have this. Uh, the, uh, one, two, three, four, five. So uh, other six are the same. Here I should put all four go out and all four come in. These um, it turns out this one also is solvable. The eight vertex model is also solvable, uh, but that uses some complicated, more sophisticated techniques than that one. Uh, okay. So rather than discuss the de the solution for this one, I'll tell you a related model for which I'll tell the phase diagram because that model comes very often when you do uh, critical phenomena. That particular model, the, the critical behavior of that is seen in many uh, systems. So let me describe that model. That model is equivalent to eight vertex model. I'll discuss that particular. This is called the Ashkin Teller model. The exponents of this have been are match, are correspond to the eight vertex model answer. So, this is the last one I will tell. The Ashkin. The Ising model has a two-fold symmetry, a plus and a minus. So they ask the question, if I have four-fold symmetry, what is the most gentle model you can write? So instead of spin spinning plus one and minus one, you can think of them as on a lattice, you have A, B, C, and D. So they live on a square lattice. And then you have nearest neighbor interactions at each side could be A, B, C, or D. And then you have many interactions, A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, and B, B, and D. Similarly, you know, the uh, B, C, B, D, C, D, six of them. But by symmetry, you can reduce it to two. You know, you, you don't want A, A to be different from B, B. This is the most general uh, four vertex model. The four with a, for a model with four fold symmetry, this is the most general model you can write. Then it turned out that this particular model can be mapped onto some kind of uh, icing variables as follows. So I will not tell the mapping, but this particular model maps onto. Two color icing model. So this maps on to. So if you see, a, if you look at a, some problem with a fourfold symmetry, it should correspond to some parameter space of the Ashkin Teller model. And this one can be mapped on to a uh, icing model of the following kind. So let me explain what that is. And I, but what I will do is I will tell the phase diagram of 
this particular icing model. You have a square lattice. At each side, I, you have two variables. One, a sigma i, and one an si. Both are icing type, plus one or minus one. If it is icing, you just had a si. But now you say there are two icing variables at each side. And the given a certain configurations of sigma i and si, the Hamiltonian or the energy is minus j si fj, sum over nearest neighbor. This is our usualizing interaction. Minus j, well, j1 and j2, but let's keep them j, j. Sigma i, sigma j, sum over i, j. If I just had these two, then it's two icing models. I don't care. I, I don't have, so there must be one more something else. So minus J4, summation what? We want to couple them. So the coupling looks like SI, SJ, sigma I, sigma J. So when J4 is zero, it becomes two decoupled icing models. Otherwise, you have a coupling between all of them. In general, J, it could be J1 and J2, but let's keep J, J same. It's easy to draw the diagram. This particular model can be mapped onto that one. Two. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you will take many of the interactions with the same. Okay. So this is, so I will call this as the Ashkin Teller model, uh, but two colors, because you know you have sigma, Two of them. You can, of course, generalize it now. You, once you write like this, you can generalize to n color Ashkin Teller model too, but this is the two color. Now, this is a nice space diagram. Why I tell about the space diagram is that you know, when we were studying some, uh, some models of four fold symmetry, this keeps coming all the time, and it's very difficult to pinpoint where it is mapped to. I'll tell you why that too. So the phase diagram looks like this. Uh, so this is J. And this is J4. So J goes in this, okay, J goes in this direction. This is J4 equal to zero. So along J4 equal to zero, if I increase my J, at the icing transition, there is some icing model transition. So this is my icing. Okay, icing. Let me draw the diagram and then mark it. If I increase J4 slightly, a small amount, and I increase J, I wouldn't expect much change. So there'll be some curve that goes like that. This curve sort of ends here. Let me draw first and then tell you. So there's some phase diagram like this. Now let me tell you the different phases and then I'll tell you about the critical exponents that this model has. What is the phase here? If I put J4 equal to zero and increase J, I go from an ordered phase to disordered phase to, what is the order there? It is ferromagnetic. Ferro, it says that expectation value of SI not equal to zero, sigma I, not equal to zero. The disordered phase corresponds to expectation value of SI equal to zero, sigma I equal to zero, and SI sigma I is also equal to zero. Correct? And 
there is a phase here. So this is a funny phase. This is a new phase which says expectation value of SI equal to zero, expectation value of sigma I equal to zero, but SI sigma I not equal to zero. So that's a new phase that comes in there. So each of the spins are zero, but there's a, uh, each of the spin individually are zero, but SI sigma I is not zero. Now, you ask, there is a fourth phase here that corresponds to, you know, J is very negative, it corresponds to the antiferromagnetic phase. You don't bother about that. But now, the important point is that this entire line from here to here, so this entire line from here to here is critical. Meaning, in the Ising model, for example, you had M, you had H here, you had E here, you had one critical point at TC. Here, this entire line is critical. So if I look at the, if I, if I make the transition along this line, at this point, you get different, different exponents. It is very critical. Normally, exponents don't depend on the parameters. But here, the exponents depend on the parameters. There are there's a line of fixed points, and the answers depend on the parameters you have. So if you do, a, if you take a four-fold model, four-fold symmetry, and let's say do a Monte Carlo simulation, depending on the model you take, you get different answers. So it's difficult to pinpoint what your model corresponds to. Okay. So now let me tell again what each point corresponds to. There are a couple of points that are known. This is the icing model. This happens to be the q equal to four. So this is the q equal to four part. This is icing. So that is alpha equal to zero. This corresponds to alpha equals uh, parts. What's the answer of parts? I must have written it in somewhere. Alpha equals two by three. And then this line continues all the way there. So this final endpoint is alpha equals minus two. So as you go from here to here, your alpha changes from two by three to zero to minus two. The CV is not zero. No, no, no. Whenever you write something goes with a with a power minus alpha, it only focuses on the singular part. There's always on the background a smooth part, which is always non-zero. Okay. So uh, what is so the, it turns out that from the eight vertex eight vertex model answer, you know the critical exponent along the entire line. Okay. So now, uh, what is constant? So let me make one last remark. Something remains constant along this line, which is beta by nu is one by eight, and gamma by nu is seven by four, all along the line. So what change? Huh? Yes. So no, no jumps. It goes, it varies continuously from here to here. But beta by nu and gamma by nu is kept fixed at one by eight and seven by four, which is the icing answer. That is this answer. So as you go along from one to another, what changes is nu. So the exponent nu is changes, nu changes along the line. And nu is one exponent which is very difficult to measure numerically. So unfortunately, so it's very, so if you have modeled four-fold symmetry, it's very difficult to find the exponents very well in the numerical experiments, for example. Okay, so, uh, so uh, uh, no. What you find numerically is beta by nu. No, what you measure directly is beta by nu. 
So this is the Ashkin Teller model with uh, the general model for four-fold symmetry. Is there anything else I should tell? Any other model I should tell? I think I've told summary. So this is just a summary of some uh, known models. It is just to say that if you ever come across some similar sounding things, you should know where to look up. And the place to look up is uh, Baxter. Baxter exactly solved model. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to read because you know every chapter will refer to the previous chapter often. So you know it is a, from equation 3.5 you get this. So we have to be a bit careful when you read. But it's not necessary to know the solution unless you're do, working on this area. You need not know the method of solution. But you should be able to figure out how to read and get the result from looking at the model and then looking at the result. You should be able to. Okay, so I will stop. On this one. So here, along this line, there's a transition here. This face, this one. Ah, so uh, the Ashkinella model also has some duality properties. So it turns out that you can determine this line well, but uh, this is an example where there are two transitions, where the, instead of one transition, there are two. The, so the duality argument based on the, based on the fact that there is one critical point, and when you map from one to the other, you get the KC. But there are two critical points, then one maps to the other. I don't know whether I'm answering your question. So these two, these two lines correspond to that. Ah, yes, yes, yes. So at this point, when J4 is very negative, it corresponds to sigma i and tau i being opposite, anti-ferromagnetic. You don't care about which one. And that order is lost as you go from here to here. So you're asking whether that is solvable or not. I don't think, this line is not known, only this point is known, but I don't know whether, I understood. So there is this entire line, which is not known, but this particular point is known. Uh, this point is not known. So this point corresponds to self, you know, in the duality corresponds to self dual point somehow. But here when you come, what happens is this point gets mapped onto this one. So I don't know whether this one corresponds, I don't know whether, maybe this point is also solvable. I'm not very sure. But this one is solvable, I know. The other one I don't know. Okay, oh, one more thing I had to say. So, there were some uh, learning outcomes we had fixed in the beginning. So, at the end of the lectures, students should be able to solve a generic model on Bethel lattice. Yes or no? Will you be able to solve? That much was done very clearly. Be able to set up transfer matrices in 1D for short range systems. Yes? 50% yes. Be able to calculate many terms in the low temperature, high temperature expansion of simple systems. That I think we have done many times. Okay, reproduce the main steps in the solution of Ising model. There were two solutions given, one the commutable method and one the uh, um, free fermion method. That was not very clear, both of them were, I don't know about the free, was either one clear? Okay, so that is a, it is a, so you should try to brush it up a bit. And the last one was roughly have phenomenology of solved models. Roughly know the phenomenology of the solved models. So I, I, I gave a set of models that is solved. So that is uh, no, just information. Uh, so I think we have achieved what we, uh, not achieved partially what we started off with, so it is good. <laughs> yes.